very much. Um, so I, I wanted to start today actually with uh, telling you a bit of a story, and that story is going to motivate some of the science that then I'll discuss afterwards. Um, so the story that I wanted to tell you is actually recounted in a book by uh, Robert McFarlane called Landmarks, which I highly recommend. It's a really beautiful um, piece of work. And it's a story about Roger Deakin, who was an English writer and documentary maker on waterways. And the story is about how Roger's uh, mentee was actually at Cambridge University studying and invited Roger to come uh, be with him or come to Cambridge and give a talk on his work. The mentee's hope was that his mentor would give an amazing, fabulous talk and it would make the mentee feel um, uh, good about their relationship, but also make everybody else think that the mentee was great because the mentor was great. All right, so this is his recounting of that event. He says, I stared dedicatedly at my shoes, embarrassed that my friend was failing to perform in front of my academic peers. It was only later that I realized it wasn't a failure to perform, but a refusal to conform. Cambridge seminars expect rig rigor and logic from their speakers, embrace subtlety of exposition and explanation, and tested proofs of cause and consequence. But water, which was Roger's subject, doesn't do rigor in that sense, and neither did Roger, though his writing was often magnificently precise in its poetry. For Roger, water flowed fast and wildly through culture. It was protean, it was slip shape. And so that was how he followed it, slipshod and ship shape at once, moving from a word here to an idea there, pursuing water's influence too fast for his notes or audience to keep up with, joining his watery subjects by means of an invisible network of tunnels and drains. And I love many things about this passage, um, but the part of, there are two pieces of it that I, that I probably love most. And the first is that it immediately makes you think about Roger's subject as a network, a network of tunnels and drains. And so that was how he followed it as he went through an exposition about the work. So the idea that knowledge is a network is certainly not a new one, and that's not something that Roger came up with or that Robert McFarlane came up with. And in fact, it reminds me a bit of this uh, passage from Henri Poincaré's 1905 Science and Hypothesis, where he says, the aim of science is not things themselves, as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality knowable. Um, so that sort of gestures towards the idea that knowledge is a network, but I think that Dewey really hits it on, his, on the head in 1916 in his Democracy and Education, where he says, knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. Thus, we get at a new event indirectly instead of immediately by invention and ingenuity resourcefulness. An ideally perfect knowledge would represent such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problem presented in a new experience. So this notion that knowledge itself is a network is gestured to in both Poincaré and in the story about Roger Deakin, um, but I think it's actually much more pervasive if you go through the um, annals of history. The second idea that I really like from that uh, story is that knowledge is a network that's in some way learned by example, in the sense that we can have a lecture that displays a certain network architecture. Roger Deakin's lecture displayed the sort of tor torturous, watery, tunnel-y architecture that was very consistent with his subject, but there are other types of network architectures that can also be um, shown through a lecture as well. So we could imagine that I'm at Penn giving a lecture on linear algebra, which is one of the under graduate courses that I teach at Penn. And perhaps I have um, a architecture in that lecture that's much more organized with each concept connected very closely with the concept uh, right next to it in time, but also in content. Alternatively, if we have a lecture on UK waterways, for example, from Roger Deakin, we may have more of this torturous, holy nature to the organization. And then if we have a uh, lecture on history, perhaps we follow tendrils of ideas so that you have much more of a linear flow consistent with the linear flow of, of the historical account. <clears throat> Um, so an interesting question when thinking about this is, is there an optimal way of walking through a network in lectures or books or papers, et cetera? Okay, so this sort of uh, digression into stories and analogies is something that you might do really late on a Saturday night, and then you wake up on Sunday and you think, oh, how can I actually put this into a concrete um, experiment that I can test uh, in humans? So what we do is that we suppose that 
we are giving a lecture that's composed of 15 general concepts, and um, those concepts are organized in a particular way. I'm showing you here a relatively modular architecture, but you can choose uh, the architecture that might be most relevant for that content. So we have these 15 ideas, they're related to one another in a heterogeneous manner, and the challenge that any uh, person has when they're trying to communicate their ideas, either in lecture format, book format, um, paper format, or just speaking to one another, is how do I take that network architecture that's present in my head and translate it um, to the uh, listener in a way that obeys the constraints of time. So the constraints of time require that I only say one word following the next, and I can only walk through one concept following the next. So I have to take a potentially high dimensional network architecture and map it into one dimension of time so that the person on the other side can optimally reconstruct what that network architecture was. So here pictorially is the problem that we face when we communicate with one another. Um, so here's the brain of the speaker or writer. It has to map a potentially high dimensional network architecture uh, into a one dimensional object. Uh, so it's a string of con concepts traversed in time in a way that allows the brain of the listener or reader to reconstruct what that network architecture was. So this sounds like something that's uh, challenging, but somehow we as humans do it fairly well. And we in the lab are really interested in understanding how we do it so well. Um, I also wanted to note that this problem of inferring the patterns of pairwise dependencies from incoming streams of data is not something that's just characteristic of lectures. It also allows us to learn language, to segment visual images, to parse tonal groupings, uh, parse spatial scenes, infer social networks, and perceive distinct concepts. So it's actually something that's fairly pervasive to how humans function. Okay, so in an experiment, what we'd like to do is to measure the human perception of a network topology. And if we can understand how humans perceive a network topology underlying a continuous stream of information, um, then perhaps we can understand how to better uh, organize that information so that they can see the network better. So here we have an example network. We're going to let each node in the network be a word or an image or a movement. And then we'll allow each edge in this network to be um, an allowable transition between nodes. So I am allowed to go from 5 to 6. I'm not allowed to go from 13 to 2 because there's no edge between 13 and 2. Okay? And then what we do is that we construct a sequence of stimuli by taking a random walk on this graph. Or it doesn't have to be a random walk. It can be any walk that we uh, define. But an example, uh, a very simple example, is to use a random walk. So this stream of images or words or movements is defined by a random walk on this graph. Now, in order to measure the human perception of the topology, we need to have some, uh, some uh, reflection of the human perception. What we do is that at each stimulus, we require the participant to perform a task so that their time to react can be measured. And that time to react gives us an understanding of how expected that transition is. If they respond very quickly, they expected that transition. If they respond very slowly, they did not expect that transition. Okay, so their reaction times to each of these little tasks gives us an indication of whether or not they were expecting uh, that transition, and that in turn gives us an understanding of how much they are learning the underlying network architecture. So first I want to ask, what do we already know about this problem? We already actually know a lot about this problem from the field of statistical learning, in the sense that we know that humans are extremely sensitive to transition probabilities. So if I have a node A frequently followed by node B, let's say 70% of the time, 75% of the time, then humans will expect B to occur when they see A, right? And then if we have um, C following A about 25% of the time, humans will expect C a bit, but not as much as they expect B. Okay? So we know definitely that humans are, able, are sensitive to these transition probabilities. Um, now from that information, we can ask what would we expect from this graph? Uh, so this, if you, if you have, you may, some of you may have noticed already, this is a pretty special um, network and, or graph. It's a K4 regular graph, which means that every node in this network has exactly four edges coming out of it. So what that means is that if you take a random walk on this graph, you have an equal probability of uh, passing along any of the edges, which means that the transition probability on every edge is 25%, so one out of four. Okay, so in that sense, if humans are just sensitive to transition probabilities, their reaction time 
flowing through this graph should be equivalent. So our prediction would be, because every edge has a transition probability of 0.25, human expectations should be equivalent across all transitions, and thus so should human reaction times. Now, we've been studying this uh, particular scenario and a couple others in few domains, and we're going to test that expectation. The first one is in a motor domain, um, and so this is work by Ari Khan in the lab, who gave a poster last night and is here if you want to talk to him about it more. Um, so here is a stream of stimuli. These are five buttons uh, with one or two of the buttons highlighted, and that indicates a particular motor response. So this means press your pinky, this means press uh, your thumb and third finger, this means press uh, three and four, press finger five, etc. And this stream of uh, stimuli is defined by a random walk on a graph. The hands are placed on the keyboard in this particular way. Um, but I and while I'll walk through this uh, task a little bit more in the next couple minutes, I also want to mention that we've done the same thing in the context of visual perception and the same thing in the context of um, a task manipulated, manipulating uh, social cognition. Okay, so in general, this is what we find on that particular graph architecture, and I'll show you a couple others later. So what we find is that humans are very swift at responding to transitions inside of one of these clusters, and relatively slow at responding to transitions that cross the boundary between clusters. And I want to emphasize again that this is unexpected if the humans are only sensitive to transition probabilities, because the transition probabilities on this graph are flat. They're all 25%, okay? So humans are doing something else in addition to just understanding uh, transition probabilities. Now, so we've observed this. We call it the um, cross-cluster surprisal effect, meaning that people appear to be surprised or not expect that transition between clusters, and, and that leads to a slower reaction time. But we've also studied several other architectures. One of them is this lattice graph here. And what we've noticed is that humans, in, on average, tend to respond much more swiftly when we're showing them a stream of stimuli from a modular graph than when we show them a stream of stimuli from this lattice graph. So what that suggests to us is that humans are sensitive to not just specific pieces of an architecture, but to the entire architecture as well. And that there may be certain graph topologies that are um, more uh, easily learnable for individuals. Uh, meaning that they match our expectations really well, or that we can adapt our expectations quickly for that architecture. <laughs> now, an interesting question is exactly what is happening in the human mind when that might explain this, uh, this odd reaction time effect. Um, so this is work from Chris Lynn in the lab, who's also here, so if, and he had a poster last night too, so if you want to talk to him about this, you can do that as well. Um, so what he was thought is that perhaps we can think about the human as sitting here at a particular stimulus, uh, x at t plus 1, and in order to build an expectation of what is coming next, that a human has to be able to connect the, what's currently in front of them to what just happened. Because these are always transitions, in order to expect a transition, you have to be able to connect these two objects, right? Um, so what happens in humans, potentially, is that they're trying to remember what happened just before in order to allow this building of expectations. But humans may have an imperfect uh, recollection of what just happened. So we may have some probability of recalling the stimulus at t minus delta t rather than accurately recalling the stimulus at time t. And we'll actually call that probability q of delta t. Then we can also write down the error of a candidate probability distribution as E of Q. Um, these two, I should say, in general, is that we're trying to build some a, um, a model of this behavior that minimizes both errors and computational complexity. Okay, so by writing down the probability and then the um, error of a candidate probability distribution, we can also write down the complexity of the error distribution, which is just the uh, entropy. And then the total cost of the distribution is its free energy F, where beta is a uh, parameter that sort of tunes the sensitivity to either the entropy um, or to the uh, error of the candidate probability distribution. Now, we know that a simple distribution that minimizes this free energy principle is the Boltzmann distribution here, where beta is the inverse temperature parameter and Z is the partition function. Um, so in order to give you a little bit of an intuition for what that means in terms of how humans might respond uh, in their reaction times, here is an illustration of those same ideas but with pictures. 
So here what you have is as beta goes towards zero, the individual at their current spot has an equal probability of remembering anything that happened in the past as the cause of what just happened, or as, yes, as the precursor to what just happened. And if this is what the individual is doing, basically there's no memory in the system, um, but they are certainly mem minimizing mental resources, so they don't have to remember anything. The expectations about the architecture will look like this. In other words, a fully connected graph. They have an equal expectation of assuming of you have an equal probability of assuming that any node in that network um, was the precursor to the one that they're currently seeing. Now let's go to the other side here on the on the right. So here as beta goes towards infinity, um, the probability distribution becomes a delta function perfectly at uh, t equals zero and or delta t equals zero and that means um, that they have perfect memory, they're minimizing mental resources and their expectation of the graph should be perfect, meaning that they ha assume a 25% chance of following along any of the edges given where they are in the network. Now, what's interesting is that I don't think either of these is particular, I'll show you data actually, that neither of these is particularly common in human participants and also not particularly um, believable in terms of human reaction times. But what we see here is something that's much more common and understandable, which is a beta of about one. So here you have a fall off in your probability of remembering what just happened as a precursor to what's happening now. So you're much more likely to remember something recent than to remember something far in the past. Um, and if this is the uh, memory distribution that you have, then this is the sort of expectation that you're building. So you tend to build strong expectations inside of a cluster and weak expectations of transitioning um, between the clusters. Now this is just the model and just a simulation, but we can take this model and go back to the original data and say, is, uh, does the data actually support this model? In, and we'll do that in two ways. The first way is that we'll actually fit uh, the model to the data and estimate beta. So what we have is actually a fairly large data set where 71 individuals have um, betas that we can't really distinguish from zero, 44 have betas that we can't distinguish statistically from infinity, and then 243 individuals have beta values that fall in this range which with a mean value of 0.31. Now what's interesting actually about this is that we can say at that beta, if that's fairly common for, um, for humans, we can ask whether that beta would produce a certain level of, um, of the cross-cluster surprisal effect or the modular lattice effect. So what you see here is the difference in expectation between the um, edges that are, exist within a community versus the edges that exist between a community or a mod module. And what you can see is that, that cr this cross-cluster surprisal effect actually has a maximum very close to where we see the beta values for most of the humans in our experiment, um, which to us indicates that we were a bit lucky in actually seeing this. Um, and here is the, uh, of the expectation of the modular graph, the reaction time of the modular graph versus the lattice. And again, what you see is the, the difference between those two is maximized at around the same beta that we see in the um, human individuals. Okay. So that's at least initial data that supports the model, but it doesn't directly test the existence of that um, memory distribution. So next what Chris did is he said, well, is there a way for us to explicitly test the existence of that memory distribution? And he actually took an NBAC working memory um, uh, task data from a completely different cohort of uh, humans. And for those who aren't familiar, a two back working memory task is where you're shown a stream of stimuli and you have to remember what happened to before and you have to say whether what happened to before is the one that you are looking for. So here is just a simple example with letters. Let's say you're currently at A and your target is B and you might have some error in remembering uh, that. So perhaps you actually remember something that happened delta T ago. Um, so what you can do is that you can go through all of the data collected in an NBAC working memory experiment and you can specifically look at those errors and you can say when people thought that they saw uh, the target but, that, but they didn't actually see the target, what is, what is the one that they were um, expecting? So here what we have is the probability um, of remembering something that actually helped it happen delta T ago rather than at T. 
And uh, you can see that that falls off for the one back experiment with a beta of 0.33. For a two back task, it falls off um, with a beta of 0.33. And with a three back experiment, it falls off with a beta of 0.25. On the right hand side um, is just the combination of one, two, and three back together. And the uh, average beta there is 0.32. Now remember, what I just showed you for humans here is a beta of 0.31 from the network learning experiments. So what this is suggesting is two things. One is that um, this uh, functional form of the memory distribution is something that you can extract simply from a, an NBAC working memory task, and that's consistent in shape with um, what we postulate in the model. And then secondly, that the uh, beta value that you would extract from an NBAC working memory task is um, within confidence intervals the same as the uh, beta that you would extract from a network learning experiment, or at least the ones that we did. Um, so that gives us some confidence in the uh, accuracy and verity of the model. Now, the last test that we wanted to perform is to say if humans are actually, maybe I'll actually go back here to just illustrate something for you. If you uh, look at the reaction times over here on this side, each of the reaction times would be expected to be the same. And here, all of the reaction times would be expected to be the same. Um, one of the ways that you can distinguish between whether humans are in this class or in this class is if you violate their expectations. So let's say I show this person a connection between here and here. This person will, will respond very slowly because they're not expecting that. Whereas this person, if I show them that transition, they will respond just as quickly as they have been responding. So there will be no average change in their reaction time. Um, so we can actually use violations of the graph that they learned to test uh, their, the way in which they're remembering, um, and also to confirm that they're actually perceiving the topology that we're showing them. So here is uh, a ring graph. So this is another architecture that we used, and this is the one that we used specifically to test the violation of expectations. And we violated human expectations in two ways, either going from the uh, white node to a blue node, or by going from the white node to one of the red nodes. So a going from white to blue is a short violation of their expectations, and going from white to red is a long violation of their expectations. Okay. So our, and our expectation is that if they're understanding this um, topology, they would slow down when being shown those violations. Here is their reaction time for short violations. And you can see that this change in reaction time is, does not, the confidence interval does not include zero, which means that they are on average slowing down when we give them, when we violate their expectations. And that's for short, true for short violations and also true for long violations. But the, the really important part is this one, where we compare long violations versus short violations. And you can see again that that confidence interval does not include zero either, which means that they're significantly slower when you violate their expectations over a longer topological distance. Okay, So that means that there is actually some perception somewhere of the um, of the underlying topology. I say some perception somewhere because we actually have, have not been able to have participants tell us really in words what they think is happening in the experiment and whether they can, and they, they don't seem to be able to verbalize the network architecture. Um, so that's something that um, is interesting and something to be followed up on. Um, and actually speaking of uh, follow-ups, there's a couple of different directions that we're taking this part of the work. The first one is asking, what is the optimally learnable graph? And does it have a topology that is common in language or in nature? Um, or perhaps in well-written papers or in well-written textbooks? The second big question we has, have is, do different humans prefer to learn information on different graph architectures? And if so, what can explain that? And number three, when we employ this process of graph learning to grow knowledge networks more generally, do we ever form gaps in knowledge? And if so, why? And what do we do with them? And Anne Sizemore is a graduate student in the lab who's not here today, but who is, um, has done some really interesting work to extract knowledge gaps in networks and to try to understand them from the perspective of applied algebraic topology. Um, OK. So what are the underlying brain network processes that might support this kind of learning? And in asking you that question, I always come back to Aristotle's um, uh, thoughts in his metaphysics where he said, mind thinks itself because it shares the nature of the object of thought. 
for it becomes an object of thought in coming into contact with and thinking its objects, so that mind and object of thought are the same. And I think a really interesting question is, and maybe not as far as Aristotle is going, but is there some interesting correspondence between the architecture that we're using to understand these graphs and the architecture of the graphs themselves? Is there a topological consistency across the architecture of the knowledge and the architecture of the neural system that allows us to learn it? And if so, what does that mean? Is that just happenstance, or does it tell us something about um, the computa neural computation? Um, but in order to start addressing that question, we've begun by looking just at the human brain and asking the question whether we see modular organization, similar to the modular graph that we saw in the network learning experiments, and then whether, ask whether or not differences in modularity in a human brain could explain differences in the ability to learn. So in order to address these questions, we've had to tackle a couple theoretical and computational challenges. Um, one of the challenges was how to actually parsimoniously represent neuroimaging data in a way that allows for us to address modularity um, formally. We've been using a lot of uh, network models to do that. A second challenge is to detect modular structure in network models of brain connectivity. We've been using modularity maximization, although that's, it's actually maximizing that quality function is MP hard, so there are some interesting heuristics that have had to be developed. And then the third challenge is detecting evolving modules as a function of time, and for that we're using using a multi-layer modularity maximization built on um, some work by Peter Mucha in 2010 in science. But um, when we study this modular organization in humans, we've been particularly looking at it during learning, and we've been performing these rather long and somewhat arduous um, multi-day, multi-week learning experiments. This data is actually from um, Scott Grafton's group, where uh, I did a postdoc, and he um, had some individuals practicing a sequence, uh, motor sequences, deterministic motor sequences over the course of six weeks. And I'm just blowing up for you the connectivity between um, visual and motor regions here on the left. And this is for at zero weeks of practice, two weeks of practice, uh, three weeks of practice, and um, or six weeks of practice. And here what you have is the actual indication on the brain of what the, these large motor and visual swaths are. And what you can see is as a function of training, there are certainly two modules that are present consistently across all of these data. These are fMRI bold data, I should have said. And then the connectivity across the two modules, which is on the off diagonal blocks, decreases significantly with practice. So you can see is relatively green here, goes to lighter blue, um, darker blue, and darker blue. Now that's just the visualization here of the statistics. So this is the average value in these off-diagonal blocks, and you can see that that falls off significantly as a function of the number of trials practiced. The way that we interpret this is that there's a growing module autonomy as individuals are able to learn these um, sequences over the course of, of six weeks. So from that, we've asked the question of whether we can deduce some basic uh, simple principles for how, why a brain might be able to do this and might be able to have relatively flexible modules that accompany learning. And so we actually went back to a little bit of the physics literature to say, um, are there principles that have been previously derived to say whether a system should be relatively adaptable or constrained based on its network topology? So the, ba the basic intuition is that if you have a network architecture that has two modules, um, for example, it can have many more, but two modules that have very strong connectivity between them, this is a system that's relatively constrained dynamically. So if any piece of this system tries to change its activity, um, it has to it's being pulled back to the norm or the average by the rest of the system. Whereas, it, so we would think about this as a relatively constrained system and we would associate it with a slower learner in our, in our conceptual framework. On the right hand side is what we think of as a more flexible uh, fast learner. So these are two modules that have very little connectivity between them um, and we think that that would allow for adaptation of a single piece of this without being dragged back to the median. Um, so what we did is that we actually went into a couple different studies to address the hypothesis that networks that can flexibly adapt are those with greater modularity. And the first study we had showed that flexible modules support this swifter learning over three days of practice. The second study showed that swift learning is associated with flexible segregation over six weeks of practice. But I think the real, um, the, the real 
exciting proof was in this final one just from last year where Marcelo Matar in the lab um, showed that segregation of modules at rest, so before they've ever started practicing this task at all, um, predicts learning six weeks uh, in the future. So that's, and, and the relationship was, was as we had predicted, which is that this type of architecture where there's very little connectivity between the modules at rest is um, supportive of faster learning in the future. And I just wanted to mention that this, this idea that modularity and that um, changing connectivity either within or between modules is important for learning is also showing up in other cases. So we have a study that's uh, led by Carolina Fink um, where she's studying a, a dual and back training experiment. So this is audio and visual together. And what we can see is the same sort of, we're showing the data in the same kind of way here. Here's zero weeks, two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks. And these two modules that seem to be particularly activated are in the um, default mode system and in the frontal parietal cognitive control system. And we see over learning that the default mode system becomes strongly, more strongly connected, um, sort of relatively linearly. And then the frontal parietal system also becomes more strongly connected within itself over time uh, with learning. So I will note that this feature is actually a little bit different than the motor skill learning. So here we're getting stronger connectivity inside of these modules as a function of time, or as a function of learning. Whereas in the motor sequencing task, we are getting changes in the integration between the two modules as a function of learning. And so I think what that suggests to us is that actually the um, modular features that are supporting learning may be either within or between these systems, and that may be task dependent. Trying to understand that is something that we are excited to do um, in the next couple studies. But for now, what we've done is to say, in general, it seems that this flexible modularity seems to be important for learning. Can we demonstrate that a couple, across a couple different tasks and in different cohorts? So what we found is that this flexible nature in network modules, particularly actually in, in frontal parietal circuitry in a couple of these studies, um, is predictive of individual differences in visual motor learning, in cognitive flexibility, in working memory. In, um, it's also correlated with the uh, reinforcement learning rate in a reinforcement learning task, and that's work that's done in collaboration with uh, Daphne Shohami at Columbia. It's also predictive of future learning. Two other labs have also reproduced this effect, so the correlation with working memory, and also the correlation with planning, and, or a, a study showing a relationship between flexibility and planning and reasoning. Um, so there are other labs that are showing the same sort of general principles. In this area, we have asked about searching for design rules. So why do some types of learning induce changes in system strength and others induce changes in intersystem connectivity? Could we perhaps create a parameterization of task families that would allow us to manipulate these two phenotypes smoothly and continuously? Um, so that's one exciting direction I think that we're looking forward to moving in. And then second, what is it that actually induces this reconfiguration? Who is able to respond to training with greater network reconfiguration and why? What constraints determine what sorts of reconfiguration are easier or harder than others? And how much energy does it take to induce a network uh, reconfiguration? And um, for that, I'm actually reminded again of a, a passage from Aristotle, but this time from the physics, where he says, now if there was a becoming of every changeable thing, it follows that before the motion in question, another change must have taken place, in which that which is capable of being changed or of causing change had its becoming. And I think what we're very interested in asking is, can we take that notion, but to this network reconfiguration that's supporting learning? Can we build a theoretical model from data that predicts the changing, the becoming, and the causing of change? Or in other words, how does the brain's activity, can, how can it be altered by a perturbative signal? The work in this part of the lab is, has, um, studied not just what we have, which is a network of structural links that has a very rich architecture that we're excited to um, really characterize descriptively, but also move more towards what we seek, which is not just a description of the architecture, but a theory for how a change in activity of one brain region can impact the activity of all other brain regions. So if we have changes in activity in these three areas, how does that affect the activity of the rest of the system? We've formalized that problem in the context of network control theory, which is a relatively new subfield of, of uh, control theory and engineering that's focused on how do you control network systems. 
Um, in order to understand control, we have to do two things. We not only have to stipulate what the network is and describe its architecture, but we have to stipulate a model for the dynamics that occur on top of that architecture. We've been studying a relatively simple model of dynamics. So here is the state of the brain at time t plus 1 being equal to the adjacency matrix of the uh, white matter structure times the state of the brain at time t, and then plus some control um, u. The first question that most people ask when they study controllability in a network system is, is the uh, system theoretically controllable? And you can address that question by looking at the smallest eigenvalues of the t-steps controllability gramian, which is here. It's just given as a function of the adjacency matrix and this B matrix, which tells you which regions are being controlled. For all of the brain networks that we've studied, this uh, value of the smallest eigenvalue is really super tiny, which means that this system is actually practically extremely difficult to control. And that has motivated us to ask not whether the whole system is controllable, period, but whether there are particular types of strategies that this control strategies that this system could enact or could respond to that may be relevant um, for brain function. The two types of controllability strategies we've studied are number one, um, the ability to steer to many easily reachable states, and then number two, the ability to steer to difficult to reach states. Um, I'm notice I'm blinking red, so I'm going to skip the mathematical definitions and just give you the basic idea, which is that network control uh, differs across different brain regions. Some of them have more or less modal controllability or average controllability. Those differences uh, change with age. In fact, both types of control strategies increase as children develop from the age of 8 to the age of 22. And this is each data point here is an individual in a large um, developmental cohort. And also that network controllability is correlated with impulsivity, which is a measure of executive function and cognitive control in youth. So collectively, those data, um, actually including this last one, suggest that network control theory could be a way for us to think about cognitive control and the reconfiguration of um, functional networks within this system. Um, I'll skip. We've been doing a little bit to demonstrate this also works in predicting the effects of stimulation, but I'll skip that. And I will just go to the open questions in this domain. Number one, what is it about certain network topologies that makes them easier or harder to control? Um, we've started to do a little bit of work in this area with uh, Jason Kim, who's a graduate student in the lab, but there's much more to do. Does the answer to this question help us to understand time scales of control, so transient control versus uh, long-term or persistent control? And uh, may it be altered in certain patient groups? And we've been working with Michael Breakspear in bipolar and Boris Bernhardt in epilepsy to show differences in control. Um, and with that, I guess I would like to and uh, here is a summary of what we did today. We started with McFarlane. We went through knowledge network learning across Aristotle into brain network dynamics, across Aristotle again, and into um, network control. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.